Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Lovely to see you. Hello, my darlings. It's the least I could do. <laughs> uh, today I'm going to do Piers Morgan, who's just walked off Good Morning Britain, his TV show, because of a kerfuffle over things he said about Meghan and Harry, particularly Meghan. Plus, I'm going to do Prince Charles, speaking of the Meghan and Harry thing, Prince Charles. I haven't done him before, many people have asked, because you know, it's not really very interesting to me, but these are interesting pictures. And I've also done his handwriting, and I'll tell you what his handwriting says, because that's really fascinating. I made a goof because I decided I was going to do Cy Vance of the Manhattan DA's office. He is the Manhattan DA. And in fact, what I did was I did pictures for the Manhattan DA's office without realizing that I really wanted to do Cy Vance and Donald Trump. So I'm going to give you both. The DA's office pictures, which are kind of interesting, and an interaction between Donald Trump and Cy Vance. Very interesting. Plus, at the end, I'll do transition pictures for Robin Williams. Thank you to everybody who subscribed this week. It's great to have you along too. Welcome to the Enlightened Beings Club. That's what we call the existing subscribers. Welcome. To the donors. Oh my God, you'll never know how much I appreciate your appreciation. <laughs> If you haven't got your thank you note yet, you will. It's a bit like the stimulus check. If you haven't got it yet, you will, I promise. Uh, to the commenters, really interesting comments about that last video. Several mediums wrote to me, one in particular saying, you know, I've been a medium for 40 years and I can tell you for sure that people, your loved ones, join you when you die. They're there to greet you on the other side. So, you are misleading, meaning me, you are misleading people by saying there's nobody there. Well, first of all, I didn't say there was nobody there. But secondly, and I think most importantly, it's about finding out when this transition period is. When is that? I have no idea. Eternity, by its very nature, is timeless. So who knows how long these transition pictures last? A nanosecond? A million years? We don't know. So it may be on the other side of the light, the dome, the membrane, whatever I choose to call these things, <laughs> randomly, uh, it may be on the other side of that that you're greeted by, um, by your loved ones and whatever. So let's get on with Piers Morgan. His real name's Piers O'Meara. He comes from an Irish family, but his mother married somebody later on called Pew Morgan. And so Piers became Piers Morgan, dropped the pew. But uh, he was a phenomenon, a prodigy in the newspaper industry originally. He edited The Sun, he edited The Daily Mirror, this is in Britain. And at 29 years old, he became the youngest editor of a newspaper forever. But I actually saw him on Celebrity Apprentice, and I thought he was phenomenal. And it showed exactly why he was such a major success. And after that, he went to CNN made a bit of a hash-up of Larry, <laughs> of Larry King's program. Larry King didn't like him, and America really didn't like him. He decided to take on the gun control issue and tried to get America to give up its guns, as I recall, and um, that's never gonna go down well. So he lost that job, and he was on America's Got Talent, plus a whole bunch of British shows. Very, 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 very successful man. Not liked by most, actually hated by many, but he has that knack for drawing attention to himself and relishes it. Now, of course, he's jumped feet first into the Harry and Meghan saga. He had an involvement at one point and since then has been quite vitriolic, apparently, in various things he said about her. And then he goes on this show after the Oprah interview, his morning show he had in Britain, and said all sorts of different things and trashed her. There were 40,000 complaints to Ofcom, which is the uh, regulatory body that oversees broadcasting, about what he said. And he walked off the show when he was challenged. He said, that's it. And by mutual arrangement, he resigned from the show and will no longer be on there. Anyway, so I looked at his pictures. And when I found him, he had a sort of curved scraper thing. And he was walking around a circle of rubble, debris, and he was just shoveling the last bits into the ring, into the circle. 
I thought maybe actually looking at it that he'd wanted to leave this show, Good Morning Britain, for a very, very long time. Maybe it was wearing on his nerves. Maybe he didn't like getting up early in the morning. I used to work for a breakfast show in Britain on the radio and you had to get up so ridiculously early. It just screwed entirely with your day and your biorhythms and everything. So I can well imagine if he wanted to leave. But he was scraping all these things together like he was completing the circle. As if to say, yeah, this was sort of my plan to get out of this job and this has been the perfect opportunity. So he walks off and ahead of him, there were these heavy drapes, which seemed to signal the end of an era, which would make total sense. And he peers through, he peers, peers through. And on the other side, there is a big hangar-like space. This is the gap, I guess, between major jobs. And there before him is this open doorway and he looks at the open doorway and goes, wow, this is a major opportunity. I must take this. Doors are opportunity, usually. Now, it turns out that there's actually a new national TV station starting up in Britain. It's going to be right-leaning and have very strident voices on there and opinions and so on. And uh, I'm sure will be incredibly controversial. And Piers Morgan, who's a conservative, would fit into that. But... It does seem that somebody, if not GB News, somebody is going to welcome him and go, Hugh, come on in. You get viewers. You bring money in. Come on, we welcome you. And cause a ruckus over here instead. As for Prince Charles, he's somebody who has been very controversial too over the years. He doesn't really have a role in Britain. If the Queen's feeling... A little off that day or queasy he might go and do her role he's got charities he's even got his own town on this land he owns he built a town called Poundbury in Dorset which is cute and celebrates his view of what architecture should be uh, he likes the old-fashioned kind of architecture and doesn't like modern architecture at all and he's built this town or had somebody build it for him. And uh, it's so cute. But, uh, of course, he married Princess Diana in 1981. That was controversial too. And he got divorced from her and married Camilla Parker Bowles, his true love. And now he's just sitting around, because he's the heir apparent, he's just sitting around waiting to be king. I got a piece of his handwriting and I took a quick look at it so that we can understand better the kind of person he is on the inside, not what we read in the newspapers or whatever. Not that I read newspapers, but uh, the public image is often different to how the person is on the inside, of course. So I took a look at the handwriting and here is what it says, right? He's very sharp and opinionated. Incredibly so. And capable of withering put-downs or belittling criticism. Some of this is developed, perhaps, to combat the endless attacks he's experienced during his life. Because he had views on architecture, he had controversial views on organic farming, on alternative medicine. He's been attacked all the way down the line. So part of this could be his natural defences. Uh, it could be petulant, demanding, selfish. He holds firm on his opinions and can't have his mind changed easily. However... He's passionate about what he does believe in and is prepared to learn and expand his field of understanding as long as what he's learning doesn't contradict his established belief system. Very uptight about that. He's smart and sharply analytical and has a definitive kind of yes-no answer. It applies, no, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, let's do that. No, let's not do that. He can sort it out in a second. He's not good at the relationship thing. He's really more of a buddy, a pal, a cohort, a partner in crime, something like that. He understands that, though, about himself, because he enjoys the meeting of minds or a sense of humour that you have in common. Uh, but he doesn't quite get the exposing of the depths of the soul thing. To him, passion is something you reveal in the course of your actions, not by opening up your heart and venting to people. He's more about duty and keeping the show on the road than dancing around your feelings and sensibilities. Very stubborn. Oh my God. Clenched and stubborn. Like not giving an inch stubborn. Almost seething. 
sometimes. A lot more insecure than you'd imagine around certain topics. There's lots of inner machinations. He's learned to contract his heart energy in tough situations rather than expand. And it's this, the contracted heart energy, that makes him unrelatable to the public very often. He's open. He's got no choice to a certain extent. And he's willing to share himself with others. But his inner demons or worries force him to maintain a certain distance from people. But there's a doggedness there that has enabled him to lock himself down, stay solid, and keep going no matter what. At a deep level, there are a lot of wounds that haven't healed, but which refuse to scab over. Despite all of that, he has a strong sense of who he is and what he stands for, presumably because he's been reminded of it since the day he was born. Now, he's involved in the Meghan Markle thing because... There were people suggesting, nobody's pointing a finger directly, but it's kind of indirectly round the back way, uh, people are suggesting that he was the one who was worried about the colour of the baby and how dark it would be. In which case, if that leaked out that that was true, eh, that might be the end of him being king. Because it's not just about him being king of Britain, there's Commonwealth countries as well, and 60% of the people in the Commonwealth are people of colour. So that will be terrible for him. And uh, I think the pictures reflect that. Because when I found him, he was standing there. And there was somebody else with him. Some kind of lackey. And this lackey was going, uh, Your Royal Highness might want to step down this way. So he goes down this little ramp between two walls. And he finds himself in little rat runs. You know, like the trenches in World War I. It's a bit like that. And you duck, and you keep your head down, and you keep going. And they go in a zigzag formation. Do your duties, but remain out of sight. So he does. And he spends his time going around these little rat run things. Eventually, he comes to what looks like a tarpaulin. Again, marking the end of an era, probably. Black is not a good colour for these sort of things. So there might be an issue there of some kind, he emerges into a space where there are massive spotlights on him. Three of them, glaring his way. It's very bright. He covers his eyes like, oh my God, what is that? If he can move past that attention, whatever that is, the glare is off temporarily. And there's a doorway there, opportunity, and he goes out and... Somehow the pressure is off now, for whatever reason. And he looks out and there's greenery, uh, trees and lovely countryside. Maybe he retires to Poundbury, who knows. But it's just lovely scenery. And it feels gentle and like this period, this era, is over now. Interesting. Okay, so let's do Cy Vance. Now, this is a tricky one because, as I said earlier, I actually asked the wrong question. I thought, oh, I'll do the Manhattan DA's office where Trump's tax returns now sit spread across desks while people pour over them. And uh, uh, that's good to do those pictures, but it's not Cy Vance. He is part of that office. He leads the office. And so, therefore, a set of pictures came that weren't necessarily related to him, but they were interesting. When I went into the energy... There was a disc, and this disc was razor thin, but sharp, so it was spinning, and you didn't want to go anywhere near it, because this thing would cut you, and you wouldn't even know. It was incisive, it was deliberate, it was tough, it was unyielding. Very scary. You do not want to deal with this disc, right? In fact, one person had lost an arm when I went in there. <laughs> One of these figures. It's like, oh, you've lost an arm. I have? Oh, my God. The DA's office has cut off my arm. In fact, it's rather like those knives they sell in infomercials. You know, the ones that go through vegetables so quickly and easily that you could slice three fingers off and you wouldn't know. Those kind of things. It's like razor blades. That was the DA's office. And there was this corridor, I suppose it was. And down the side of it, 
they weren't curtains, but they were folds in the wall. And there were people in the folds looking out, wanting to see where the blade was. And when they saw it coming, they would just retreat into the folds. It cut through the walls. There were people inside the walls. <gasps> I've been found out. So this is the office that dealt with Paul Manafort and a whole bunch of other cases to do with fraud and mobsters and whatever. And this operation they have is extremely powerful. And you wouldn't want to get in its way because it just keeps on going and will slice through the landscape. Right? Useful backdrop to Cy Vance, who is the son of the Secretary of State for uh, Jimmy Carter back in the day. Cy Vance, his son, is a Yale and Georgetown educated lawyer, a trial lawyer, considered one of the best in the country, and uh, just not to be messed with. The smile is lovely, but uh, underneath he's a shark. I mean, a really, really determined, fierce guy, and you wouldn't want to get in his way. Trump, unfortunately, got in his way because of the Stormy Daniels payments that the uh, Manhattan District Attorney's Office is now investigating, because it spread from that to a whole bunch of other stuff. In fact, Michael Cohen has just been interviewed yet again, I think the seventh time, uh, by that office, uh, which doesn't bode well for Donald Trump at all. So what I thought I would do is I thought I'd actually put Donald Trump and Cy Vance next to each other and see in the pictures how they reacted. Right away, Donald Trump reached out to Cy Vance and goes, Hey, buddy, we're both New Yorkers. I'm sure there's something I can do that will help ease this situation so that we don't have to go to the brink of prosecuting me. Come on, let's not do that. That's just so messy. How can we sort this out? A deal, you know, the art of the deal. Cy Vance sees the arm reaching out to him, grabs it, throws Donald Trump over his shoulder and slams him to the floor in a judo move. Aha! Shut up! Get down there and stay down. But no, Donald Trump gets up, springs to his feet. All righty then, he says. Behind him, there are two paths. One goes up, one goes down. The path going up is very similar to the one that we saw when he was about to lose the presidency. But he decided to go round again anyway and stay a presence in politics, which he's desperately trying to do right now. Hey, Republicans, send me all your money. Don't send it to the Republican Party. You're suckers, you're dimwits. Send me your money. So he saw that kind of path and thought, you know, I think I'm going to go up here. We'll make this work somehow, Sigh. But actually, when he tried, I noticed there was a look in Cy Vance's eyes, like, don't even try it. Like, like that, you know, remember the judo move just now? I got lots more like that, buddy. Donald Trump got a little bit intimidated, and suddenly now he's really worried. So he takes the road down. There's a tunnel at the bottom. He hides in the tunnel. Oh my God, what if they indict me and stick me in jail? Sweat, 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 sweat. But it's a tunnel. Comes out the other side. Whew. Maybe his lawyers get a delay. Maybe there's a problem and he wriggles through a loophole or something. Oh, I'm fine. It's looking good. It's looking optimistic. He starts to go around a corner and there are two furiously angry, ravenous dogs. <laughs> Investigators? Prosecutions? Grand juries? Maybe? Something? You're fortunate I can't actually draw the dogs, so... <laughs> they're not represented in the pictures very well. But uh, they're enough to scare him. <laughs> Panicking now, he scrambles up a bank. Now he's got to get out of it by any means possible. And I stood at the top of the bank and he appears over the top, right, scrambling on his hands and knees. And all the time I can hear these dogs out of sight going... <laughs> and he gradually got pulled back down the bank again and out of sight. Now it's not unthinkable that he could 
wangle his way out of this and get back on the path again. But when I was watching the pictures unfold, I couldn't see the dogs anymore, thankfully, because I can't draw them. Uh, but I could see him gradually losing his grip <laughs> and basically going back down the bank uh, with a feeling of, oh my lordy, I am doomed. <laughs> That's what it felt like. I'm not counting him out completely because, uh, you know, he's got this far without ever being held accountable. But uh, certainly those dogs were vicious and the bank was steep and he slipped out of sight. Ah, uh, so that's that. Let's finally do Robin Williams. He just seemed very, very empathetic to me. Very accessible, very vulnerable, very emotional. And he's made several movies that uh, I absolutely adore. Uh, Dead Poet Society. Uh, I thought he was brilliant in Aladdin. He was great in Mrs. Doubtfire. You know, all the movies he's done. Anyway, he died in 2014 killed himself at the age of 63 when he discovered that he had Parkinson's and was having visions or something and shakes and all sorts of different problems. So I did his transition pictures and I'm learning just to stand and wait and something always happens. He comes rushing in, not running but rushing and he goes right past me and down to the end of this particular patch of tunnel, symbolic tunnel. What I didn't understand was there were red capped mushrooms, like something out of Alice in Wonderland, red capped mushrooms here and there on the ground. And he walked round them and then stood, just kind of looking down, panting slightly, out of breath. And it felt like a rush of adrenaline had happened. Like on the other side of the tunnel, he'd gone, okay, I'm gonna do this, I can do this, I'm gonna do this. One, two, three, mm. and in he comes into the tunnel. That's what it felt like. That's the kind of adrenaline. One, two, three. Uh. Because he had to assimilate the fact that what he'd just done is what he'd just done. That it really had happened. That he'd really gone through with it. To his right was the main tunnel I always see. Only this time it wasn't a straight run. It was looped. It was like in little steps and it was looped like that. You had to walk along one, then you came back and you walked along the other, then you walked back. Many, many loops. And he just walked incredibly contemplatively, asking himself questions. Should I have done it? What choice did you have? I know, but I had to do it. Well, yeah, you had to, but should you have done it? I don't know. Maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. But you can't go back, I know, now it's done. And in fact, I sat in the tunnel at the top just watching him come, and it took a very long time. When he finally reached the top, he looked down at where he'd come and went, should I stay, should I go? How can I go? I'm stuck here, this is it, I made the decision. Constantly thinking, thinky, thinky. There was a point where he thought about it so much and the thing I always see, the grace, the, the winds of motion, the currents that cause you to continue going, wrapped around him and said, come on, enough reflection, time to move on. What's done is done. This way. And he felt that pull. And he went on up the tunnel, around the corner, and it brings him into the notional cave I always see at the end. This is it. But, for the very first time, there was like a moat around the dome, making it slightly more difficult to get to. Across the moat was a bridge. What I felt this meant was that 
It was consolidating his intention. This was refining a million thoughts that he'd had about this whole thing, stripping them away and making him focus on one thought, submission, evolution, ascension. Strip all that stuff away, all your thoughts, all your queries, your quandaries, your worries. Focus here. Walk across the bridge. This is it. This is your path. And suddenly, when he reaches the end of the bridge, I felt, just as he must have felt, a tremendous lifting of a burden. Have you ever been on a long haul flight, like 13, 14, 15 hours? When I was a travel reporter, I used to do it a lot. And you get to your destination and you are worn out. And if you're in a lovely hotel, you go to your room and there's a big fluffy white duvet on the bed fluffy pillows it's all immaculately clean and sterile and it's just amazing and you sink into the pillow you pull the duvet over you and you have the best night's sleep you've ever had in 50 years you just feel great <sighs> you sink into it it envelops you this is what that was like but he was now willing. Going across that bridge stripped him of any last bout of questioning, resistance. He just turned around at the end of it, fell back into the dome, and went, oh, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. It felt wonderful. For a man who'd had so much torment in his life. It felt fantastic. And he started sinking in. You know when you put a, a piece of banana on top of a bowl of custard and it gradually sinks into it? It's like that. Oh, I'm so tired. And it came up over him, enveloped him. And he was gone. Whew, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, share. Do what you can. Uh, or follow me at Twitter, at Cash Peters. That'd be lovely too. All right, but until next time, see you guys. Thank you very much. Bye.